Good afternoon, everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone joining us. And thank you for joining us for the Government of Newfoundland and Labrador's COVID-19 update for today, March 17th. We've asked Dr. Proton Raman to join us today to share some analysis from the latest COVID-19 outbreak in our province and talk about modeling. But first, I'll turn things over to Dr. Fitzgerald to give an update on the latest numbers. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, since the media advisory yesterday, we have no new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in our province. The total number of cases stands at 1,013. There have been nine new recoveries, eight in Eastern Health and one in Labrador Grenfell Health, leaving 36 active cases in the province. Two people are in hospital due to COVID-19, <clears throat> and a total of 120,946 people have been tested to date. We are five days into alert level four on the Avalon Peninsula and level three for the remainder of the province. We will need the full 14 days to effectively determine if there has been any COVID transmission with the increased movement, and we will be carefully monitoring this over the next week. If you have any symptoms, please book a test using our online assessment and referral tool. A new mild cough is enough to warrant a test. We are holding steady, but we saw firsthand how that can change in a day. Remember your daily interactions should align with what is permitted during your alert level, not your personal comfort level or how many cases of COVID we have in the province. On the Avalon, your contacts should be limited to your household and immediate family, caregivers, or supports where necessary. Off the Avalon, you should keep your contacts to your tight 10. If we keep our contacts low, we prevent widespread transmission of any COVID cases that slip through. Keeping our communities safe means that children can return to school and families can visit their loved ones in long-term care. This is an adjustment and I know everyone is eager to return to the way things were in the months leading up to the outbreak, but we've learned so much. And to quote Maya Angelou, when you know better, you do better. The lessons we have learned from this outbreak and the COVID variants must guide our decisions going forward. We would be remiss to do otherwise. So we have asked so much of you over the last year and we, ask, we continue to ask for your patience and your trust. We will get there even though it may look a little different than before. There is no doubt that vaccinating a substantial portion of the population is the key to returning to normal. And I'm very happy to report that our regional health authorities are making excellent progress in working through the priority groups. Over 40,000 doses have been administered as of Monday. And this week, Eastern Central and Western Health are beginning vaccinations for first responders. Labrador Grenfell Health will begin vaccinations for first responders starting Monday. The process is being coordinated through police and fire employers and associations. Central Western and Eastern Health are offering vaccinations to those aged 80 and older this week and expect to start vaccinations for those over the age of 70 by the end of the month. Labrador Grenfell Health anticipates completing vaccinations for those over the age of 70 by early next week and will begin vaccinations for adults in Indigenous communities for the first week of April. As a reminder, if you are a home support worker or someone aged 70 and older, please pre-register for your COVID vaccine so that you can be contacted when we have a vaccine available for you. <clears throat> in an update from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, the AstraZeneca vaccine is now recommended for use in individuals over the age of 65. This result is the, this change is the result of new evidence from the United Kingdom demonstrating high safety and effectiveness of the AstraZeneca vaccine in older adults, particularly against severe COVID-19 disease and hospitalization. We are also pleased that Moderna is beginning to study the vaccine in children. Children represent a substantial proportion of our population and a vaccine for this age group is an important step in achieving herd immunity. As a recap, for those who may have just joined us, we have no new confirmed cases since yesterday's media advisory and the total number of cases in the province is 1,013. We must all do our part to keep COVID-19 at bay and prevent another outbreak. So please stay vigilant, be kind, and hold fast Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. We've had a good few days in a row of zero or single digit numbers in our province. This is a trend we all want to see continue. Vaccines also continue to roll out with people over the age of 70 starting next week. But again, 
from everything we've learned in the last year about COVID-19 and with the recent outbreak that brought us back to alert level five, now is not the time for celebration. It's the time for constraint. And I know it's hard given that today is St. Patrick's Day, but please try to keep celebration safe, bubbled and socially distanced. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hagee for some brief remarks. Thank you very much, Premier. <clears throat> I usually start off with a number, so I'm going to give you one. It's 36,642. That's the number of people as of uh, yesterday morning who had been vaccinated with one or two doses across the province. Um, phase one of the uh, vaccination scheme is drawing to a close. We have had excellent registration for phase two uh, in terms of our senior population. Uh, in actual fact, we've had pretty well 100% uh, in those age 75 and over. Phase two, phase two is already starting, and we've seen that with uh, some of the uh, AstraZeneca uh, that started being uh, distributed yesterday and administered in central health to first responders. Uh, as our vulnerable folk uh, become protected, uh, and as the uh, uh, incidence of active cases goes down, I think it is time to look up a little bit uh, and bear in mind Dr. Fitzgerald's advice about the present, but I think the new summer that we will see this year will turn out to be a better one than last year, uh, and I think it will probably be able to start around the usual time as long as these trends continue. I think it is a testament to all of us uh, in terms of sticking with uh, what has been a difficult regime of, of public health measures. Um, so with that sort of uh, hint of optimism and, and a look to uh, the future, uh, I'll turn it back to yourself, Premier. Well, thank you, Minister. Uh, I'll now invite uh, Dr. Proton Raman to provide an update on uh, COVID-19 modeling in our province. Dr. Raman. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, sorry, I see a really nice picture of Minister Hagee here, but not my uh, slides. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Derek. Perfect. Um, so thanks, Premier, um, uh, for allowing uh, the predictive analytics team to give a COVID-19 uh, modeling update. So this is the work that's done on behalf of the team. We have a really talented and well-experienced group, uh, mostly uh, from uh, the faculty from Memorial University, also from the Newfoundland Labrador Center for Health Information, with expertise in terms of mathematics, statistics, as well as advanced analytics. So this is a team effort. So the key points that we would like to talk about today is uh, just looking at what's happened over the year. You'll see that the Newfoundland COVID-19 dynamics are dominated by two community outbreaks that spread rapidly. And that's something we always need to be vigilant about is uh, regarding these super spreader-like events that can always happen. Secondly, is that there's been minimal community transmission really due to effective containment of cases related to importations. We've done really well in limiting community transmission uh, from the imported cases that we've had. Unfortunately, there was a recent outbreak with the B117 variant. What we've learned is that that can spread very quickly. But on the flip side is that public health measures were very effective in controlling the spread of B117. So we can control it if we listen diligently to the advice uh, from Dr. Fitzgerald and our team. And finally, just I realize the sense of optimism and I, I share it as well but still we need continued vigilance to maintain the minimal community transmission mm. and to also minimize the probability of future outbreaks. So those are the things we're gonna highlight briefly. So regarding the epidemiology, so when you look back over a year, this is the slide that you see, and the two focal points for some uh, would be the two outbreaks, uh, one in March and the other one in early February of this year, and we'll talk about the one in February in detail in a few more minutes. But the other story is actually what happened in between, and that's excellent community control um, uh, due to uh, the compliance among the Philanders and Labradorians in not letting the virus spread within their uh, community. So what has this resulted, in, resulted to? When you actually look at our province as compared to other provinces, we've done exceptionally well. And so this is due to the collective efforts, again, of the Newfoundland and Labradorians, and also with very uh, good, appropriate uh, public health measures, um, and just the combination of the two things. So 
So let's look back over the year. And the deaths, I realize, are a crude indicator, but they're still important um, to, to look at in terms of what's happened over, 20, uh, uh, over 2020. So the first thing to realize when you're trying to predict how many people would pass away in a given year is to look back at the trends. So if you look at a 40-year trend for Newfoundland and Labrador, unfortunately, there are more deaths in, in every succeeding year due to the older population. Also, if you want to predict deaths over months, because over a year may not be sensitive enough, you have to appreciate that there's less deaths in the summertime and more death in the winter, likely due to uh, the flu season. So taking these two trends into consideration, uh, what we have done is to develop a, a short-term forecasting, uh, which you see in blue, by month uh, for the year 2020, with confidence intervals around it, is because this is a predictive analysis. Then what we have done is used red dots to mark the actual number of reported deaths that were experienced during 2020. And so what you see here is that the predicted number of deaths for 2020 is 5,369 using the model that was developed. And the actual deaths reported for 2020 was 5,374. So a slight excess, but not overwhelming. So what this data does not actually have is the granularity regarding specific subsets of individuals or diseases. And so that analysis is still pending. However, overall, there's not been an excess number of deaths compared to what would have been predicted. And so, and this relates to both COVID and non-COVID deaths. And it's a reflection that overall our health system and was able to tolerate this pandemic uh, quite well. So let's look at the cases from the most recent outbreak. Uh, so this is what we're used to seeing, a surge of cases and this sort of uh, 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 two different sort of uh, cyclic uh, peak. So this was, as you can appreciate, somewhat artificial and, and in terms of the two peaks, and that's because of the large volume of cases that were noted and the testing that was needed, there was a slight reporting delay. And as a result, just looking at this, it's slightly harder to model. So we actually had to anchor it. Um, so in the subsequent modeling, the best way we thought to anchor this was using the known symptom onset by, by age group. So if you actually anchor it by symptom onset, uh, so these are only individuals that had symptoms, what you're actually seeing is the typical graph of an outbreak with a very quick rise and then a gradual fall. And so we'll actually use this subset of patients to understand better the dynamics uh, of what happened with respect to the most recent outbreak. So the first thing that you see are that those individuals under the age of 20, the natural history of this virus is to spread, likely gave it to parents or other people within their household or adults they came in contact with. And you can see the pattern of transmission from those less than the age of 20 to those more than the age of 30. This is one of the more important slides that I'm gonna show you. And that looks at how quickly the virus took off. It's a very rapid spread and it was doubling every two days. So you can see why swift and decisive health measures had to be taken and when they were done, because if you waited two more days, you'd have double the number of cases. On the right hand side is also a very important story. And that's how effective the public health measures were and how overall everyone complied with it because the cases decreased by half every four days. So this was a scary event and it was really well managed. And this is what the graph is showing. Another way of looking at it, uh, and that's slightly <coughs> more technical, is we often talk about the effective reproduction number. And essentially what you want that number to be is less than one. And then any particular outbreak or pandemic will slowly subside. And this is exactly what's happened. And since mid-February, we have persistently had a effective reproduction number less than one. The final metrics that sometimes used to look at how good uh, we have in terms of control for community transmission is to look at the test positivity rate. We've done exceptionally well in this regard prior to the outbreak with numbers anywhere between 0.1 to 0.2% as the seven day average. It peaked to about 5%. And just to give you an idea though, and perspective, Ontario yesterday was 4%. 
but we've been able to manage the outbreak really well, and we're back to our pre-outbreak uh, numbers of, again, about 0.1 to 0.2 percent over the last few days. So again, managed the outbreak really well, and we're back to where we were before. Just a couple of uh, slides in terms of healthcare utilization. Um, this slide here is just to make the point that these cases have consequences. So if you see a large number of cases, then there'll be hospitalizations, and some of the people that'll be hospitalized will end up in the ICU. So this was for our first outbreak, and this was for our second. Why is the scale different, or the proportion of people that were hospitalized seems to be greater in the first outbreak? Because this cohort was older as compared to this particular cohort. What's happened now with the experience that we've had nationally and, and the fact that each of um, the cases with COVID and the outcomes are logged and made publicly available is we actually interrogate that data to help with our predictions because thankfully our cases uh, traditionally have been lower. So using those models, uh, what we could do when we actually see a surge of cases is we predicted, and this is in the dotted line, what the, the hospital occupancy would be with the active number of cases uh, that we saw initially. And you can see it played out pretty well, and the model had a pretty good fit with the actual number, which is in uh, the more solid lines there. The same thing in terms of ICU occupancy, and this is something we follow closely because this is one of the vulnerable points, not just for our jurisdiction, but all jurisdictions in the world. And you can see we predicted um, around the third week of February, approximately five ICU admissions. What we actually uh, noted was uh, six for a period of time, but again, a pretty good correlation. So these cases have consequences, but we are able to predict what the healthcare needs are going to be using our analytics. The other thing I wanted to touch on today was the impact of the SARS-CoV-2 B117 variant. So the, there were 344 viral sequences that were sent away, and then uh, subsequently we got the results back. And best to look at it, uh, what happened prior to February of 2021, and what happened uh, afterwards. So in terms of the, the variants that were noted, the most important thing uh, on the top part of the slide is that there was no cases of B117, which is otherwise referred to as the UK variant, no cases of B1351, uh, which is the South African variant, and no cases of P1, which is the Brazilian variant. But as Dr. Fitzgerald and others have mentioned, and we all know by now, the outbreak that occurred in February was due to the B117 variant, and we had 178 sequences or cases related uh, uh, to that, which to some extent explains the rapid explosive onset of, of this particular uh, outbreak. So let's look at the impact that this particular variant had, because this is conceptually a really important thing to understand, is how the virus is mutated and how we have to think a little bit differently over the next few months as we try to manage this particular outbreak. So this again is mapping based on date of symptom onset, and what the orange dots here are the actual cases that were noted, and then it was subsequently modeled, and this model is slightly different, but what it shows is that the initial increase had a reproduction number of 6.4, and the decrease had a reproduction number of 0.6. The worldwide experience with the B117 variant is that it's between 30 to 70 percent more transmissible. It's easier to catch. So for this model, we assume that it was 50 percent greater. Knowing that, we can work backwards and say, hey, in the same setting that this outbreak occurred, if we had the original variant of the SARS-CoV-2, how many cases would we have generated? We would have generated about one-third the number of cases that were actually reported, really highlighting that we really have to respect the new variant because more transmission means more cases, more cases means more health consequences. So this is my last uh, slide, and to make this point of 
what is the potential impact of the emerging variants of concern, such as B117 to Newfoundland? So this is modeled on actual data. So for a two month period, for instance, we are reporting approximately 23 imports per month. Those imports sometimes lead to secondary infections, usually due to close contacts. And over a two month period, you could have, for instance, 71 cases. This is what's been reported. Now, on Monday, um, the Ontario Science Table reported that 49% of the new cases that they're seeing in Ontario now is B117. What is the potential consequence? The modelers and the scientists are potentially predicting a third wave in Ontario. It is reasonable to assume that if the numbers go up in Ontario, because a lot of our importations are from that province, we're going to see more cases. For every case that lands at our border from Ontario, from now on, there's a 50% chance that they will have the B117 variant. Our experience with the B117 variant is that it is spreads quicker within households. But our other experience with the B117 variant is that we are able to manage, contain this as long as we are stringent and follow public health guidelines. So the most important thing here is to listen to Dr. Fitzgerald and her team. They're guiding you based on the epidemiology they see within the province and uh, what they see outside uh, of the province as well. You know, essentially now it's a race, isn't it? It's a race between injections or vaccinations and infections. And to really help secure the win, what we really need to do is to keep the infections as low as possible so that we can vaccinate many individuals because by keeping the infections low we're buying time and it's time that's going to allow us to vaccinate most of our Newfoundlanders. So in summary, we've done really well in controlling this outbreak. We realize that now, but SARS-CoV-2 infections including B117 are still um, expected and we shouldn't be surprised about that. The B117 variant as we've seen can spread very quickly but the public health measures are quite effective in controlling the spread of all variants of SARS-CoV-2, whether it's the B117, B1351. It's the same things that we have to do, but we have to be vigilant. And this continued vigilance is needed to maintain minimal community transmission and to minimize the probability of further outbreaks. Uh, thank you for your time and thanks, Premier. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Rahman. We'll now open it up uh, to questions uh, from the media. Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, there are seven reporters registered for today's call. The question and answer session will be conducted in two rounds, where each reporter will have the opportunity to ask one question and one follow-up per round. Following this, I will ask each reporter if they have one final question. Our first questions are from Peter Cowan with CBC. Please go ahead. Dr. Rahman, I'm wondering if you could talk about what modeling you did in advance of the election and whether or not any of it uh, lines up with the assertion that the Premier made in February that there was a prediction of a spike coming in March. Um, so, so thanks for your question, Peter. Um, so th there's two different elements to this, right? So in terms of the recent um, outbreak that was actually seen, this was more like a super spreader event. If we look at the reproduction number, it is really um, not possible to predict uh, the uh, when a super spreader event can occur. Um, this is uh, because these are stochastic or random events. Um, so at the time, we had very good community control and it was really hard to predict. Um, that is the B117 variant of all the ones that will actually escape into the community, that there would be a large, multiple large gatherings that would actually foster the transmission, occur in slightly younger individuals that are asymptomatic and that would further uh, um, increase the transmission. So in terms of outbreaks, these are not possible to uh, model. Our discussions um, usually uh, for the predictive analytics team is with public health and the Department of Health and the health authorities. We did meet, uh, did, uh, meet with the Premier on a couple of occasions for general overviews. It really had to do with health care capacity. And what we discussed with respect to looking at the second wave in Ontario is, is that there's a natural order based on community transmission, not on super spreader events. 
um, that the doubling time is about 10 to 12 days in terms of cases. So when there's very little in terms of community transmission, it takes a while uh, for the number of cases to g get up to a level where it's going to stress the ICU. So the discussion that was had was what's related to surge capacity, what's actually needed in terms of ICU, how quickly do we have to respond. Uh, and these were hypothetical discussions based on data that were actually seen in Ontario, but there was no modeling because what you need for modeling, whether it's short-term forecasting or long-term predictive modeling, are cases to go by because it's the pattern that we actually use to look forward. And, and there was no pattern there because we had no cases at the time uh, of our discussion with the Premier. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, I'm wondering what's your take on all this data that you've been able to sort of digest and how or what does it change about um, how you move forward and what measures you bring in or don't bring in? <coughs> um, certainly when we look at uh, this latest outbreak and uh, B117 and how quickly it spread um, and how we saw you know a significant amount of asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic um, spread uh, especially in the younger population uh, I think you know that gives us a lot of uh, pause for thought when it comes to how we how we deal with um, with co uh, COVID and and the variants of concern going forward so we have to be a, a little more vigilant. We know, uh, you know, what's happening, as Dr. Rahman said, what's happening in Ontario, seeing more and more a higher proportion of their um, cases being related to variants of concern. Uh, we know we're going to start to see more importation of variants of concern. So we do have to take that into account when we're, um, when we're looking at uh, relaxing these public health measures and moving forward. So we are we really have to think about this as we're relaxing our measures in the face of a more transmissible um, uh, variant and and so we have to do it uh, accordingly so you know that does mean that we're going to have to look at uh, gathering sizes a little more carefully and and those situations where we would have a lot of people uh, coming together uh, for an event so we have to look at that a little bit more carefully going forward Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson with the Telegram. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Raman, uh, uh, we are usually given a, a heads up when there's going to be some sort of modeling. Uh, I'm curious to know when, how far in advance your appearance here was planned. Um. So I was asked, I think, um, a week ago, but there's previous discussions in terms of us uh, uh, coming to model as well, and so a lot of it had to do with um, uh, other priorities uh, that, that were there. Okay. Um, also, uh, in your presentation, I don't rec recall whether you suggested to be 117 uh, can actually be more severe, which is some evidence that we're hearing. Is that the case? Uh, I think so, Peter. That's my read of the literature, is that uh, when you look at the UK, who's got the, the best experience in terms of the B117 and a very strong epidemiological uh, group, um, they are reporting um, increased uh, severity, not only increased transmission, both in terms of hospitalizations and ICU. And the other thing that we've noticed in terms of the kinetics is that you end up in uh, hospital a little bit quicker is, as well, uh, but that's somewhat anecdotal because our experience uh, is somewhat limited. Uh, but in following the literature, I'm pretty convinced that uh, it's actually a more severe variant as well in terms of complications. So you're right. Thank you. Our next questions are from Richard Duggan with BOCM. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Dr. Raman, the last time that we had a presentation like this, I believe it was either uh, last summer or just before last summer, um, you mentioned a little while ago that uh, you were asked, you think it was about last week, uh, to put this presentation together. Um, and I guess, uh, why do we believe that it was so important for us to share this information at this particular time? Well, 
I mean, uh, Richard, th there's two things. One was it, the last time it was presented was after an outbreak. This was after an outbreak. Uh, it takes time to see the data in order to determine modeling. Um, so there was an appropriate amount of time for Dr. Rahman to uh, present the current modeling in, in terms of projections and how we did. No different than after the calls cluster. There was a little bit of time before he presented, and uh, I don't want to speak for you, for Dr. Rahman, but, but that's that was the kind of thought process. Uh, so, a, so absolutely, uh, Richard, and, and so it takes a little while uh, for the data to come in and uh, for the models and the uh, analysis for it to work. The other thing, important thing is that um, there is a, a greater sense that we're actually doing well now, and it's also to reinforce and to respect the variant and the potential that another outbreak can occur that I thought it was quite strategic of uh, the Premier and uh, uh, to, to sort of have this uh, discussion. Thank you. Um, Dr. Fitzgerald, it was mentioned in, in the presentation that, and I, I believe I heard this correctly, that there's 50% chance that, uh, you know, for example, in, uh, coming from Ontario, that there's 50-50 chance that uh, cases that we get could be a variant of concern. Um, with that in mind, and you, you touched on it a little while ago about how this information could impact your decision making, with that in mind, uh, with, with there being a 50-50 chance we these variants come in from other provinces, how does that impact uh, our decisions in terms of, say, rotational workers and, and uh, just travel restrictions in general uh, moving forward? Um, <clears throat> so with regard to uh, rotational workers, obviously uh, that was a big concern for us. Uh, we're also seeing increasing uh, rates of uh, variants of concern in Alberta, which is another area where a lot of people go to work. Um, so these are, uh, that was something that we definitely had to take into account. Uh, it's mainly the reason why we have instituted uh, testing for rotational workers, um, because we know that, uh, you know, this, by the time somebody becomes symptomatic with, uh, with uh, say, a B117 variant, um, their contacts may already be spreading it. So uh, we certainly saw that in this outbreak. Um, we also saw situations where people did not become um, symptomatic until quite late in the incubation period. And so, um, you know, that influenced uh, what we recommended for testing as well. So, uh, you know, this is the variance of concern has been <coughs> really uh, factored largely into many of the decisions that we've made up to this point or since the outbreak. Thank you. Our next questions are from Patrick Butler with Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, I'd like to follow up to uh, uh, to follow up on Peter Cowan's question. Um, Premier, Dr. Rahman just said that he didn't do any uh, modeling of case numbers uh, uh, prior to the election call. What, if that's the case, what were you talking about uh, last month when you said that you uh, had looked at probabilistic modeling before uh, calling the election? So two things. Uh, one, he said that there was not enough cases to do a predictive modeling. So in the absence of predictions, you need to make decisions. And so I uh, looked at the probability of three different scenarios occurring, one being that we continued as we were. And don't forget, like if we can rewind to the second week of January, we had several days with no cases. We had a total of five active cases. The rolling seven-day average was under one case per day. Uh, so there was one scenario in which that that would just continue, and as it had continued for months uh, prior, before actually up until the calls cluster, really, we continued like that with the strict public health guidelines in place. The second scenario was the one that uh, Dr. Rahman just described, which uh, the natural order of this uh, disease, this virus, extrapolated from using the data that was publicly available on the federal government website uh, for Ontario or BC, where, you know, you looked at it and you could extrapolate that it would take several, as Dr. Rahman said, several weeks to months with escapes, meaning that we, you know, people who had it were out in the, out in the community spreading it before it reached a critical mass, which, you know, I estimated to be between five to, 100, five to 10 per 100,000 before it really hit that steep spike uh, of an exponential rise. And so if you kind of extrapolated from the data and where we were at the time, that was potentially months away, if it was at all to occur. 
And the third, the worst case scenario would be if we took the five cases that kind of were in, I identified at the time and said that they were gonna be out in the community and have a, a community spread uh, without being recognized and use the doubling time that existed at that particular moment in time of, of 12 days uh, and applied that. Then even over this time of the election cycle, you know, you're looking at 20 to 30 cases at, at the most. So I assign probabilities to each one of those scenarios. That's how I make decisions. That's the kind of probabilities that I would apply to different items and models and decision making moving forward. In the absence of definitive measures and definitive evidence moving forward, that's all you can do. You make the, evi you make the decisions with the evidence available to you. And the second scenario was what led me to believe that there could be outbreaks later in the year. Uh, the issue of transparency has been raised here. Um, the opposition requested this data, meets requested it. Does not move you with the model. Sorry, you broke up there, Patrick. But all the data that we used for the decision surrounding the election was publicly available. It's publicly available on the, on the federal government website in terms of predictions and, and current trends. Uh, we release every single day the cases in this province. That's publicly available data that we would use to drive decisions. Um, with respect to the modeling, as Dr. Rahman suggested, there was no cases. So you, in the absence of cases, it's difficult to model. And he even said that back when he presented the last time in May. Uh, so that's the publicly available data. The, the rest of the question kind of uh, broke up there, Patrick. Uh, sorry, am I, am I allowed to re-ask that then, sorry? Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, basically, it was just how do you respond to the criticism uh, of transparency from, from the opposition? Well, um, I mean, you know, even the, the answer is the same, Patrick. I mean, we've all the data has been publicly available. It's publicly available data. The cases we report every single day. The number of vaccines we report. The, uh, the you know, we're here with the modeling today to outline what happened in the past uh, outbreak. Um, the, the modeling that we used even to assess the safety of the election uh, and election timing was publicly available. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, the, the transparency, uh, full, we're fully transparent with the data with respect uh, to COVID-19. Our next questions are from Jody Cook with NTV. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you. Dr. Fitzgerald, the AstraZeneca vaccine, now we know that NACI has a, a um, indicated that this is to be also included for 65 plus. We've seen some variations on how countries are rolling out or not with this vaccine. Uh, what's the plan here and how we see this fitting into Newfoundland and Labrador and particularly with the 65 plus demographic when right now we know it's earmarked for first responders? Yes, so we, uh, we certainly uh, developed our uh, strategy right now, knowing that uh, the majority of the vaccine that we were going to get in was mRNA vaccine, um, so the Pfizer or Moderna product, and uh, that has been earmarked for those over 65. Those plans have been put in place. The amount of AstraZeneca proportionately that we're getting is quite small, um, and so we will be focusing that more on, uh, you know, uh, specific uh, populations likely in the younger age groups, uh, some essential workers, uh, such as first responders, uh, and that's where we'll, where we'll be focusing uh, its use um, going forward. So, um, you know, our strategy is not changing too much. This is a, an addition that allows us to get some of those groups done a little bit faster or earlier than, than perhaps we would have, um, which is really good, and, uh, and so that's what we'll be doing going forward. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Hagee had mentioned earlier the importance of uh, having some hope and looking forward to the summer and maybe returning to a summer that looked even better than last summer. Uh, but we also hear Dr. Fitzgerald, you talk about the importance of vigilance and remaining um, with these public health guidelines and maybe even enforcing them a, a little bit greater as we go into the summer. So where do you find the balance there? Um. <laughs> I don't know, if you had a crystal ball, that would be great. Um, I, I think right now, you know, we're, we're learning lots about this virus, uh, vaccine, sorry, um, and uh, learning how uh, it affects transmission, 
Uh, we've certainly seen um, a reduction in severe disease with it, its use, um, which is really good. So that does give us hope that uh, things will be able to get back to normal. But we, we had to remember that we have to get two doses of, of vaccine, or the vaccines that we have available to us right now. We need to get two doses of those into people. Um, and that's going to take us the summer uh, for that second dose. So, um, you know, we do have to consider that. We have to consider that there is increasing variance um, across the world and across the country. And that importation is going to result in, you know, we're going to see um, variants of concern imported. And those are all, at this point, more transmissible. So we have to consider that. So, yes, hopefully we will have... Uh, we will be able to move forward. We'll have a good summer. Um, you know, we'll be able to uh, do many of the same things that we were able to do last summer. But we do just need to think about how we're going to do that safely. Um, so what we're really looking at now is to try to reduce the harms as much as we possibly can um, while still uh, being able to do um, the things that, that we were able to do before. And and I think that's going to take a little, a little bit of work, uh, both on public health part and on everybody's part, really, uh, to make sure that that, that can happen safely. Okay. Our next questions are from Elizabeth Witten with All Newfoundland Labrador. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'd like to know who reached out to Dr. Raman last week to appear on today's panel. I was, I'm assuming that came uh, through the Department of Health. That is correct, yeah. Thank you. And Premier, you faced some criticism for calling an election during the pandemic, and you said that decision was based on science and the modeling that was available to you. But if you're trying to avoid politicizing the science, why then see Dr. Raman at the panel with uh, Dr. Fitzgerald during the COVID briefing, which are supposed to be a political, rather than just call a separate briefing to deal with it? I'm not entirely following the premise of your question, to be honest, but as was answered before, uh, uh, Dr. Raman uh, is giving an update after an outbreak, the same that he, as he did after the outbreak uh, in, in call, after the calls cluster. Uh, we felt that this was an appropriate form. I don't believe I'm politicizing the science whatsoever. Thank you. Our next questions are from Sarah Smelly with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi there. Uh, Dr. Raman, were there things that really surprised you and stood out about this latest outbreak as you were doing this modeling? Yes, thanks, Sarah, for that question. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, so how quick the, the spread was uh, um, and the fact that so much of it was um, asymptomatic and I was also pleasantly surprised in how the uh, population reacted to it, particularly a, a younger cohort that must have uh, stayed and abided by the public health measures and how quickly we were able to, uh, with a, a lot of effort, I realize, get down to very low number of cases. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we need to really, again, like I said, respect the virus, but also have confidence that with the correct public health measures, uh, we can take control of the situation. Um, so we're surprised in both, in both ends. Thank you. And um, I wondered, so are we now considering this outbreak as being generated by a super spreader event or was it just that it behaved like it was generated by a super spreader event? Um, no, so there was certainly um, events that happened over that week, first weekend in February um, okay. that resulted in spread of this virus. Um, certainly uh, it behaved very much as a super spreader. So we would consider this to be a super spreader event. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan with CBC. Please go ahead. Just following up on that, um, we haven't seen any analysis on exactly how the virus spread, uh, whether or not it was sports, other activities, uh, school cases, and where uh, it sort of was introduced. Are you able to provide any more details about that? Um, so we know that there were some uh, events that happened uh, over that weekend, sporting events that did uh, result in spread uh, to people who were at those events. Uh, and we know that because that was their only source of expo potential exposure. Um, and uh, with, 
regard, and then there were other sporting events that then, you know, um, because people are involved in uh, multiple sports, um, then some of that, those uh, people became infectious in other events that happened as well. So um, there are, um, there's probably a few different events that happened over the course of that weekend um, that did result in um, it being spread, certainly among that younger population. Uh, and then we saw those, um, uh, those people um, then spread it into their households. And there were many, many households where everybody in the household became infected with the virus. Um, so it certainly started as a super spreader event and there was further spread um, otherwise as well. Um, you know, Eastern Health has certainly been working hard to make all of those connections. It's been a very, um, uh, with so many cases and contacts, it's been uh, a fairly intense exercise and um, they are still working through that. And uh, I'm hoping to have some more information in the coming days about uh, all those connections. But it's, uh, it's, it sounds like it would be very easy, but it, it isn't actually as easy as you would think because you, you do have to consider symptom onset dates, potential exposure dates to be able to make a timeline. So that's, that can be quite intense. Okay, thanks. Looking forward to uh, when they are able to crunch all those mm -hmm. numbers. Uh, Premier, I just want to go back to the comments that you made that all the data that you use uh, around modeling, et cetera, was publicly available information. So why then when Patrick Butler put an access to information request in there, was it denied th uh, and the government's response was that this, these are cabinet secrets? I have no, I, I have no insight into Mr. Butler's uh, request for ATIP uh, and nor should I. Uh, but as certainly I think the public would expect that cabinet, cabinet committees discuss uh, our COVID readiness. Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't control the ATIP process and nor should I but um, and I mean surely people would think that cabinet would uh, discuss uh, through committee and through cabinet itself the preparedness of uh, the province for COVID-19. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson with the telegram please go ahead. Um, I, I really don't want to follow the issue, but uh, I, this week I've been looking online, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada. They have an update every month on epidemiology and modeling. Uh, I've searched around a few other places. I can Google fairly well. I, I have yet to come up with anything that suggests what you suggested, the modeling you had uh, predicted, Premier. So I'm just wondering whether you or Dr. Rahman or someone can point us to this publicly available information that, that you're talking about? It's, uh, it's available on, I believe the update was December 15th or something like that on the federal government public health site. And again, in the absence of cases here in the province in our own jurisdiction and our public health measures that were in place, you have to extrapolate from experiences elsewhere with which Dr. Rahman had just said and is exactly how I behaved. And, that you interpret the natural order of the disease, of, of the virus, and, uh, and uh, escapes that happen take weeks to months before it hits a critical mass where you start to see an exponential rise. That's been the experience in other jurisdictions. We had less than one per 100,000. Uh, so uh, it was a, a my opinion uh, that it was a reasonable extrapolation to assume that that uh, natural order would exist uh, here in the province and take some time to uh, hit a peak if it was to occur at all because we have uh, shown of course that the public health measures here have, as echoed by Dr. Fitzgerald and Dr. Rahman have proved to be very effective. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, and I, I just have a quick question for Dr. Fitzgerald. Um, we have uh, people who are saying uh, that they're getting conflicting reports from teachers as to what if, uh, how to wear a mask. Is there a good source somewhere online that people can get uh, good information about for kids storing and wearing their masks? Um, so certainly uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada has some good information about mask wearing and we had a video as well and I think it's still online um, about how to wear a mask and um, we had our infection prevention and control nurse specialist come on and show us how to do that um, and there was a mask uh, 
there was a video that I did with uh, um, at the beginning of the school year that talked to children and how to uh, how to wear masks. So, and as far as I know, those are still available uh, on our website. So, um, there are some resources out there as to what's the best way to to um, put on a mask, take off the mask, and uh, and um, you know make sure you wash your hands and all those infection prevention and control measures that you need to put in place when you're doing that. Okay, thank you. Our next questions are from Richard Duggan with BOCM. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. At the height of this outbreak, uh, you mentioned that we weren't testing all of our new cases for uh, variants at the time or sending them off to be tested because it just simply wasn't, uh, wasn't possible with such a high number. Um, now that we've seen our numbers get down, you know, we haven't had, we didn't have any cases today. We had one yesterday. Um, are all of our cases being tested again? Um, so any new cases that come in that are as a result of travel um, are getting tested for whole genome sequencing. And, uh, you know, that can, is actually being done now at our lab. And um, we are validating the results with the National Microbiology Lab, but we are, um, we are performing that analysis here as well. Um, and, um, you know, so if we were to get information that one of our cases was a variant of concern, we would, uh, from, our, um, from our lab, we would act on that as if it was. We wouldn't necessarily wait for confirmation from the National Microbiology Lab. We would behave as, as if it was, and we would uh, respond accordingly. So, uh, yeah, so at this point, um, any cases that are coming in from travel certainly are going to be done, uh, are going to have whole genome sequencing. There may, not, there may be some situations where we wouldn't do, like if we knew that there was, uh, that a case wasn't a variant and then somebody contracted it from, you know, they were household contact, we wouldn't need to do that um, whole genome sequencing on that case because we know that their source would be, um, you know, the, the traveler who came in. So not every case will have to be tested, but certainly those who are as a result of travel will be. Thank you. and. Um we haven't seen any cases uh, that I'm aware of that, that have been related to the uh, metro outbreak in, in some time now. I'm wondering what's the criteria for determining uh, when we can consider that outbreak over? Um, so we determine an outbreak over when it's uh, two times the incubation period. So uh, if we haven't seen a new case related to the outbreak in 28 days from the last known case, then we declare it over. Our next questions are from Patrick Butler with Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, question for the Premier. Um, there's a lot of confusion surrounding uh, the Atlantic bubble, the potential maritime bubble. Uh, Mr. Fury, have you said, uh, or sorry, um, what conversations have you had uh, with uh, the other three Canadian, uh, Atlantic Canadian Premiers in the past week, and what, what's going to happen tonight? I haven't uh, spoken with any of them in the last week, but I will be joining them tonight to discuss um, the Atlantic bubble and uh, maritime bubble and including Newfoundland. And uh, I'm quite hopeful that, you know, we can get there in the timelines that they're uh, discussing. Our case numbers are going down. Our positivity rates are lower than some of the other provinces within the Atlantic uh, region. So uh, I'm quite uh, hopeful to have a positive outcome uh, in, in conjunction, of course, with the public health officers having their discussions. Uh, so that we can uh, move towards a, uh, a, an Atlantic bubble, uh, provided, of course, the science supports it and it's safe to do so. So does that mean that you believe it's realistic that you found Labrador could join the, the bubble next month? I do. Thank you. Our next questions are from Jody Cook with NTV. Please go ahead. Thank you. Dr. Raman, when looking at this, predictive modeling, we really can see that the youth models obviously were uh, significantly greater than higher age models. Does that make it a little bit difficult for you to then take this data and move it forward for making predictions for July and August because the baseline has kind of changed a little bit with young people who were non-symptomatic and didn't require a lot of hospitalization? Sorry, Jody, it's my fault. I missed the first part of your question. Uh, can you just repeat it again? I apologize for this. 
No sweat. The youth models uh, being significantly higher in this latest super spreader, as we're calling it now, uh, than, than they were in higher age models, which was what we saw with the calls cluster. Does this make it a little bit difficult for you than forecasting for, for the summer and into the fall, perhaps, with the demographic being such a different change because your baseline has now changed for who has been COVID positive primarily, if that makes sense? Um, no, I'm still not getting the intent, I think, of, of the question. I just want to answer it uh, appropriately. Just I think uh, given that fact that it's been linked to youth, does it make it more difficult to predict for the entire province moving forward? But I, th I think it speaks to the black swanness of kind of this event as a super cluster and variant kind of outbreak. Yeah, not really. Thank you, Premier. Yeah. So, sorry, uh, Jody. So, um, when we're actually modeling what we're looking at are the, are the cases, uh, say, over the last two weeks or so, um, to get a, a good trend uh, in terms of what's going on. So what we really want to do is see a pattern and then project forward in the short term and then using mechanistic, mo mechanistic models project in the longer term. And so each of the scenarios, we certainly, certainly learn from our previous experiences and we certainly adjust things, um, but we re rerun things based on the numbers that we see uh, over the last few weeks. Jody, do you have a follow-up question? Okay, our next questions are from Elizabeth Witten with All Newfoundland Labrador. Please go ahead. Thank you. Compared to other provinces, we've never had many cases, two major clusters, and a little over a thousand cases in total. So, Dr. Rana, how effective can predictive modeling be in these circumstances with such little data to draw from to make predictions? Uh, so it's a really good point, and it's it's um, helping in terms of pandemic planning. It, it's helpful in terms of healthcare resources when utilization when we do actually have cases, but it's very speculative otherwise. So um, predictive modeling can help in many aspects in terms of, for instance, strategies for uh, vaccination, in terms of strategies for screening, but in terms of predicting cases in both in the short and the long term, um, without uh, seeing significant community transmission, that is very hard to do. So you're correct. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, uh, I'm curious, when did the whole genome sequencing lab become operational? Um, my understanding is that it's been up and uh, running as of Monday this week. Perfect, thank you. Our next questions are from Sarah Smelly with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi there, I'm wondering we have um, people aged 16 to 59 who are clinically extremely vulnerable slated in our vaccine rollout plan to get a spot between April and June. I'm just wondering if things, you know, given our changing vaccine situation, the AstraZeneca vaccine, et cetera, will, what will the soonest be that they're able to get their vaccination the U.S. make? Uh, you know, so our hope is now that we've uh, changed and we're, we're doing mainly first dose, uh, you know, at that uh, waiting that 16 weeks in between doses, um, that we'll be able to move th through those priority groups of, um, a bit faster and be able to uh, provide first dose to people uh, who are in phase two uh, fairly quickly um, compared to um, where we were or where we were thinking before. So um, I can't give you an exact timeline at this point, but certainly, uh, you know, we are moving through those phase two uh, priority groups right now and, uh, and um, we anticipate, uh, you know, in the next, like in April, that we'll be able to make some headway there. Okay, thank you. And then I wanted to ask, you mentioned uh, Moderna is doing testing on children. How big of a concern is it for you, especially given what we just saw today, um, that children can't yet be vaccinated? Um, so, you know, we, we know that um, just based on our own experience that young people can, um, can get this disease and we know that they can spread it. And uh, they often um, don't have a lot of symptoms and are still able to spread it. So it is really important from a community immunity point of view that uh, you know, we have young people vaccinated uh, in the same proportions as we have adults vaccinated. Um, with regard to the prevention of severe disease, that, that is important for some groups of, uh, of children who may have um, you know, more severe uh, comorbidities. Uh, but we know that uh, for the most part, children don't tend to end up with severe disease. Um, but uh, that's 
uh, so it's it's really uh, the focus uh, with immunizing children is really about increasing our the immunity in our communities and uh, keeping trying to keep our communities safe so we're very hopeful that uh, that those trials will give us some good information about using uh, the mRNA vaccines in, in these, this age group. Thank you. Thank you. I will now go back through each reporter to see if you have one final question. Peter Cowan with CBC, do you have a final question? Uh, I do, Leslie, and this one is about international rotational workers. Many of them are upset that they've been left out of the modified isolation, which gives domestic rotational workers more freedom. Uh, I know that this is a federal responsibility, but I was just hoping to ask the uh, three of the usual panelists, uh, when was the last time you had any discussions with the federal government, and have you been pushing to try and get the federal government to bring in similar measures to decrease the burden for rotational workers who work internationally? Um, so we've certainly had some conversations, and since this has come up again, and in our conversations with um, uh, our discussions, sorry, at the department with uh, trying to find a new way forward for rotational workers. We've certainly had these uh, discussions with uh, people at the Public Health Agency of Canada and um, in trying to determine, uh, you know, what our, um, what our abilities are with regard to uh, international rotational workers. And uh, we still, you know, at this point, our understanding is that we do not have the um, the ability to override those orders that uh, that are in place, um, and uh, but we will be uh, continuing to have those conversations in the in the near future. I hope and uh, and I hope we can see a path forward. But at this point, you know, we just we're not able to override those um, those orders that are in place. Peter Jackson with the Telegram. Do you have a final question? I have a quick question for Dr. Rahman. Um, on slide 20, I believe it is, you show a bunch of variants. Uh, I, I just want to make sure, are these variants all variants of concern? Uh, sorry, no. So the only variant of concern there is the B117 variant. Um, and so this is an mRNA virus that mutates frequently, and, and a lot of these uh, are no different uh, than the original SARS-CoV-2, and some of them actually may be less pathogenic. Um, and, and so it's natural uh, to actually see um, quite a few variants from this, uh, uh, or quite a few mutations related uh, to this particular virus. Uh, and the only variant of concern uh, that is there in that slide is B117. Okay, thank you. Richard Duggan with VOCM, do you have a final question? Yes, um, Dr. Fitzgerald, I'm getting a lot of uh, concern from parents, uh, students in K-9 are returning to uh, classroom tomorrow, getting a lot of concerns regarding lunchtime and kids taking off their masks to eat. Um, a lot of parents are wondering how this could be considered safe, uh, with many pointing out the restaurants are still either closed or in some areas of the province operating at 50% 50, uh, 50 capacity. Uh, can you speak to those concerns and how uh, it could be considered a safe activity for, for kids at this time? So um, the first thing we got to remember is that kids are cohorted and that they're going to be eating lunch within their cohort, which are the same, the same group of people that they're uh, exposed to on a regular daily basis. And so the whole point of uh, you know, us trying to keep our communities as safe as we can is to keep our schools as safe as we can. And so um, you know, there's, no, there's no activity that's going to be zero risk for anything that we're doing at this point. But uh, you know, we feel that we have reduced the risk as much as we can to allow the children to get back to school, which first and foremost is the thing we have to remember is what's important right now for children is to get back to school and to get back to those, um, uh, you know, the, to the learning that they're used to doing and to the social interactions uh, and the, you know, the, devel the social development that they need to, to have to be able to, uh, um, to live well-rounded, healthy lives. So. Uh, you know, the risk at this point um, in school is um, where we don't see it as, uh, you know, a, a big safety issue at this point, given where we are. Um, we're watching things closely. If anything changes, we'll certainly, um, you know, respond accordingly. But at this point, uh, being in school really is, th is the balance of safety for kids. 
Thank you. Patrick Butler with Radio Canada. Do you have a final question? I do. A uh, question for Dr. Fitzgerald. Um, regarding tourists from outside Atlantic Canada, um, considering most people in Atlantic Canada will have their first dose of the vaccine by the end of June, uh, that people in, say, the province of Quebec will have their first dose of the vaccine by uh, June 24th, uh, what is your public health opinion of, of the risks of allowing tourists from Quebec or other provinces uh, uh, to, to come to the province this summer? So we're still learning about how the vaccine will affect the transmission of this virus. Um, and until we have a little bit more information about that, I don't know that it would be really prudent to, to comment on, on what we think should happen from a travel outside of the Atlantic bubble point of view. Uh, you know, we, we've allowed travel within the Atlantic bubble largely because of the uh, epidemiology that exists in the Atlantic provinces, not because of vaccination rates. We allowed it last year. There was no vaccination. So um, we, we need to remember the reason why we're allowing the travel within the Atlantic bubble if we do go there. Um, but uh, when we're talking about elsewhere, we still need to consider um, you know, what, what the epidemiology is and what the effect of this vaccine will have on the spread. Hopefully by that time we will have, you know, we will have that information or we'll certainly have more information that's pointing uh, to that direction. But uh, uh, without that, I don't think it really would be fair for me to, to make a prediction. Thank you. Jody Cook with NTV. Do you have a final question? Yes, thank you. At this time last month, we were, the public health was really pushing the download of the COVID alert app, and that was very much incentivized by local business and so on. Do you have the numbers about how, of, of just how many COVID alert app key entries were made of positive for notifications of people uh, in the latest outbreak? For the minister? Yeah, Minister, I don't know if you have, you have I don't have that information. No. Um, thank you, Jody. Um, we know that there are just short of 7 million downloads uh, in use in Canada, but we don't have a breakdown for this province specifically. Um, anyone who is positive is asked if they have the app, and if they have, they are given a key. Whether they use it or not has been a subject of discussion. I don't have any updated figures since the last time I was asked this question, but I can get them for you. Elizabeth Whitten with All Newfoundland Labrador. Do you have a final question? Uh, no, I'm good, thanks. Sarah Smelly with the Canadian Press. Do you have a final question? Hi, thanks. Yes, I'm just wondering, Dr. Dr. Excuse me, <laughs> Dr. Fitzgerald, how you and your team are feeling now that it seems that you've swiftly beat, beat back an outbreak that set records in Atlantic Canada for daily case numbers and active case numbers? Um, <clears throat> so I think our team and the team in Eastern Health are feeling somewhat relieved at this point. Um, I think we're all still very much watching things closely and uh, wanting to make sure that we stay where we are, but we're always on alert and uh, we'll continue to be on alert until we feel like we're uh, you know, sufficiently vaccinated with uh, effective vaccines to to reduce the uh, to reduce the risk of COVID-19. Um, but uh, you know, I think we also have to remember that it it's it was in no small part a collective effort by everybody who who um, abided by the measures and uh, really worked hard to to make sure that we reduce the spread as much as possible. Um, you know, we've seen in other areas where. Um, even though those measures have been put in place, if people aren't compliant, the spread still happens. So, um, you know, I think it's a it's a combination of a lot of hard work on everybody's part, really. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Premier, do you have any final comments for today? Absolutely. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. I hope the luck of the Irish is with us moving into the next uh, phase of the pandemic and vaccines. Uh, so stay safe, Newfoundland and Labrador. We will get through this. We are getting through this. So uh, thanks very much for joining. Thank you, Premier. Stay safe, everyone. Take care of yourselves and each other and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>